Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Tom Sanicandro. I am the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Higher Education. Um, I expect to be joined by the Senate Chair, um, Michael Moore, who uh, represents the City of Worcester and some of the surrounding areas. Uh, welcome to the Disability Task Force. This is the fourth hearing we've had around the state, um, and I'm very excited. This is probably the largest crowd we've had, and uh, given the fact we're at, at 9 o'clock, and for some of us coming from the eastern part of the state, this has been quite a trip already, but I appreciate you all being here and your interest. Um, the hearings have been going phenomenally well, um, and we've, we've learned a lot. The expectation is that we will have some work product coming out of this. Um, one of the things before I start, I can just start with some of the, the general rules of what we're going to do. I have a list of folks that want to testify and um, that signed in. We have a huge amount of people that want to testify today, which is um, multiples of over any of our last uh, hearings. Our other hearings, we've been running and trying to stay within the two hour limit. Um, and I believe we have um, two or three times as many people that want to testify. So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, uh, what we're going to do is limit your testimony to about three and a half minutes. You can provide testimony to the committee actually through our website. Um, which is, uh, I'll talk about it now, but it's, um, and it's very hokey. I apologize for that because it's just mounted through my campaign website. It's tomworksforus.com slash task force. Not too many giggles that time. <laughs> um, and also, if you have written testimony that you'd just like to hand in today, um, we have Brian Ramsey from my office who's right there. Brian will be the official timekeeper of the testimony, and he will give you a one-minute warning uh, to know to speed things up. When you're testifying, uh, some of you will have written testimony, and it's probably better if you don't read your written testimony, if you submit it either online through the website or you give it to Brian. Just tell us your story. Tell us why this is important, or tell us... You know, what is it that you want us to know as a committee? That's probably more important, or it will be easier for us if you do that. Um, I'd also ask that you turn off your cell phones or put them on silent. Um, that applies to everybody except for me because I don't quite understand how mine works. Fully <laughs> yet. Um, but if I knew how to do it, I would do it. Um, and then we've had, we've had these hearings, like I said, across the state. We have a phenomenal uh, task force made up of experts that are looking at this issue from different angles. And so we have uh, a lot of different voices that are here on the task force. Some of them may be a little late. Some of them said would, they would be here. Um, but I just want to introduce you to some members of the task force. Like I said, Michael Moore, who is the, um, the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Higher Education. He is also co-chair of this committee. Uh, Kim Ferguson, who is state representative of the 1st Worcester District, who is very interested in special education issues, will be here. Um, Chancellor uh, of UMass Amherst Congress, Chancellor Subswamy, uh, was not able to be here, but we're joined today by the Vice Chancellor, James Staros, who's going to address you later on. Um, President Dana Malafaria from Bridgewater State University is on this. Uh, Elin Howe, who is the Commissioner of the Department of Developmental Services. She was not able to be here today, but we're joined by Dan London, who is the Central West Regional Director of DDS. Thank you for being here. Uh, Charlie Desmond, who is Chairman of the Board of Higher Education, is here. Richard Doherty, who is uh, Executive or President of the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Massachusetts, is here. Michael Stein, who I'm not sure whether he's going to be here or not, or be able to make it out here. He is um, a professor at Harvard University Law School, and he is director of the Law School Project on Disability. Jim Brett, who is president and CEO of the New England Council. Uh, Julia Landau is here, senior project director for Mass Advocates for Children. 
Deborah Hart, who is with the educational, she's the educational coordinator for the Institute for Community Inclusion based at University of Massachusetts, Boston. Brian Heffernan is also on the task force. He is a student um, at Mass Bay Community College and he's gonna be testifying later on. We also have Deborah Smith Presley, who is CEO and founder of the Garrett Presley Autism Resource Center. She is being represented today by Denise Grasty. Um, also, we have Susan Senator, who will be here, who is an author, public speaker, and autism activist. So I am gonna turn it over now to uh, the Provost and Senior Vice Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Amherst campus, James Staros. Thank you, and I welcome uh, Chair Senecandro and members of the task force to UMass Amherst. Uh, I'm sitting here uh, on behalf of Chancellor Sumaswamy, who's traveling outside of the uh, state today and therefore could not attend uh, this meeting. I know there's a lot of people who want to uh, testify, so uh, I don't want to go beyond, uh, I don't want to use much time, but just to say welcome to both the task force members and all of the uh, folks who have come to hear this testimony and to give testimony this morning. Thank you very much and thank you for your hospitality for hosting this here at the University of Massachusetts campus. Um, so we will begin. So the first person I have here is Tom Hannum, who is UMass Amherst faculty. Is Tom here? Yeah. Why don't you come up and have a seat right here and uh, Tell us what you think we should hear. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Is this on? Is this, is this supposed to be on? <laughs> it might be good. If you just push that button, hold that button in. This one? I think that's what we did. Nothing lights up when you do it. You can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can hear what I'm, I can, I'll proceed then. Anyway, um, my name is Tom Hannum. I work uh, in the music department and most specifically with the, uh, the university's marching band and uh, as well as uh, in the area of percussion. We have a young gentleman, Chris Momot, who is a, uh, a student who goes to uh, Amherst High School uh, Chris, I think is, uh, and, and Rachel, you may be able to help me. I believe Chris is probably maybe 20, 21 years old, and um, he has he has been attracted to music and, and the band. And I think that's how we've kind of come to, to connect. Um, his enthusiasm for it is is spontaneous and genuine, beyond belief. It's it's a joy to see this boy around the group. Um, he started out by kind of spending a couple of days a week in our fan building and just sort of helping out with small projects, little, you know, little things along the way, helping us put letters together and stuffing <coughs> the books, you know, some small tasks that uh, he was, you know, happy to contribute with. Uh, this semester particularly, we kind of got involved. Chris is uh, I'm doing percussion lessons with him once a week for 45 minutes. And so, which is which is great because it's an individualized you know chance for us to get together. And he loves he loves drums, you know, and he is completely affected by those. Um, but we do that for 45 minutes. We've also uh, he comes out twice a week to observe the band rehearse. So we kind of get him in a situation where he can see the group and you know this is what we work on. Watch the watch the students do their thing in the drum line and. And kind of, you know, there's a visual example for him. So, um, we've involved him in band day, got him a uniform, got him out there with the bands on the field at Gillette. It was probably the moment of his life. And, uh, you know, you see and hear the picture, you still see the pictures of him. It does tell a thousand words. Um, he also, like I said, he comes around the band building a couple times a week as part of what he's doing. So, the interaction is individual and large scale. And um, I think whereas it would be obvious to see the benefits for Chris personally, I think to see how our students gravitate to him 
want to help him. Uh, he's his, I guess his, his love for the music and how he's affected by it, it's contagious. It's absolutely contagious. So the, the, the students here love him. I think that we get probably as much, if not more, out of his presence uh, than, than he might by being around us. Um, I would just say that maybe, perhaps I don't know where this all goes, I'm just sort of jumping in, but music is kind of a universal language. And it does have a way of impacting people, regardless of your background, regardless of your age. Maybe there's something to it to kind of pursue how this particular area might be something for us to engage in a little bit more and in a wider scope. But uh, this, this young man has really the benefit of him being around our program. Trust me, it's, it's both ways. And so our students have, have really benefited quite a bit. And, uh, so, Great. Thank you for testimony, testifying. Don't don't get up quite yet. Okay. I just want to uh, introduce you to Representative Kim Ferguson, who has joined us. My apologies. Yes. <laughs> so, thank you. The other thing you just made me think of is that um, those of you that are submitting testimony, you can also submit videos and pictures through the website. So since you mentioned pictures, I think it would be helpful if you do have access to those if you just load them into the website that would be great for us um, and are there any questions from the task force Don? go ahead good morning good morning thank you for testifying how exactly did chris get connected with the um, um he is he lives in Hadley, which is where i live so we live two blocks from each other he has been around the band just as a viewer. His father has brought him out, his sister. And when Chris is around, it's obvious because he's, he's active. So I think uh, his proximity has, has helped out in terms of us sort of knowing him. And then our secretary, uh, Mary Paris, kind of got uh, in touch with him and vice versa. And it was, I think, just something where, honestly, his being kind of local and connected, and he, he's been around the band prior to getting associated in a more formal capacity, that's the way I'm describing it. So maybe it's just the good fortune of his being nearby, honestly, has really put him in touch with us. And someone recognizing his passion. Yep, and you know, one his father, his father works for the, is it the Division of Wildlife? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, Again, if you see him around music, it's undeniable. So it's, uh, I think that's how it really kind of got started. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next we have um, Mary Lynn Boscardin, who is UMass Amherst Department of Student Development, Special Education Administration <laughs> Leadership. Thank you for being here. Thank you. You're going to hear, oops. There we go. Yeah. Good. All right. Good morning. Um, this morning, you're, I'm, you're going to hear wonderful uh, anecdotes and testimony and data about what's happening currently in uh, programs that are supporting um, the Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Program. Um, what I want to do this morning is provide a bigger picture, and I did this in consultation with my department faculty, and I represent the Department of Student Development, which has special education, school counseling, social justice education, and school psychology. Um, and I am going to read part of my testimony. I apologize for that, but I, we wanted some important concepts to be placed on the table. Um, the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008, as well as IDEA 2004, both have wonderful um, mandates within them that support transition services. And this has contributed to thoughtful planning that's resulted in opportunities for, for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities to participate in post-secondary education programs. 
Uh, what we know at this time is that post-secondary education experiences of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities remain relatively rare. So opportunities such as ICE are very important. Um, in looking at the dimensions that we feel we need more information about, it includes things like social inclusion, uh, academic integration, academic and social supports, links to gainful employment and careers, and cost of participation. We support the basic premise of this initiative and believe the field of special education and career development will continue to identify opportunities for and promote the participation of students with intellectual and developmental disabilities in post-secondary settings, providing appropriate data is available to guide this decision making. Many studies have indicated the potential for long-term benefits of post-secondary education for students in general. However, the opportunity for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or any student for that matter, to participate in any program is by no means a guarantee for benefit from it. While the research in the field has helped us to better understand what works for students with other types of disabilities on college campuses, there is little understanding about what works from the research on students with intellectual and developmental disabilities in post-secondary settings, such as universal design for learning, uh, self-determination, differentiated instruction, and use of technology. Not only does the field need more information about the works to prepare students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but additional information is needed to determine what works in these alternative settings and how these experiences translate into meaningful employment and long-term careers if initiatives such as inclusive concurrent enrollment programs are to be successful. Um, it's through careful data collection that we begin to examine the fundamental limitations and fully evaluate the post-secondary education training of persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. For instance, there's no taxonomy or common terminology by which post-secondary programs, uh, participants, and our outcomes are consistently described to guide decisions about what type of college or university setting for individuals might experience success. There's little detailed and shared understanding about the nature, goals, and objectives of the various post-secondary education approaches and or pathways. Uh, consistent definitions of success and uniform measures of the effectiveness of these experiences are needed. There has been limited effort to develop and test instrumentation for gathering valid, reliable, and sufficiently comprehensive objective data on the desired outcomes of post-secondary education programs for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, more information about how individuals who support students uh, with these disabilities in post-secondary education, how these individuals are trained is needed. We need more, we need to know more about parental expectations for their children uh, who are participating in ICE as it relates to value-added measures of independent living, <coughs> gainful employment, post-secondary education, and training and community involvement. Uh, more information is needed about the long-term benefit of participation uh, by these students uh, versus particip in post-secondary settings versus a participation in other types of post-secondary programs such as post-secondary vocational career programs. Again, as it relates to the value-added measures that I just mentioned. If ICE is to experience continued success, an accessible knowledge base needs to be built and resource that provides systematic approach to organizing, gathering, and analyzing data to be used by stakeholders committed to post-secondary education experiences for individuals participating in these programs. The wide array of data from the variety of programs, participants, and experiences that ICE offers would provide guidance and support to both new and existing programs. Um, students. Uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their parents and educators will benefit from data that systematically uses high quality research that ensures state of the art, state of the art practices resulting in the Commonwealth being a beacon in post-secondary education for students with developmental and intellectual disabilities. We believe the College of Education and the Department of Student Development can help to find answers to questions through careful and thoughtful evaluation and consideration of the possible information that can be gathered. Our goal is to increase the probability for success for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities who participate in post-secondary programs 
that lead to career success. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know um, it's a bit long-winded, but we yeah, wanted yeah. to get our counsel so, in. I, I guess as a follow-up, um, when you submit that testimony, or if you do submit mm -hmm. that testimony, if you could even, so you're not going to be limited, obviously, to, a, uh, to what you submit. If you could be even more specific, you know, I know you were very specific, but you could be even more detailed in what you submit. If you could do that and submit that to the committee, that would be helpful. So I would appreciate your sort of even looking at what avenues of research or what direction should we look at first. And those types of things I think would be helpful for us so to consider. So prioritization would be helpful. Yeah, and even 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 go further down than what you sort of were running across the top, right? I if was. you could dive in at some point where you think it's very important. You know that's and, dangerous when you ask academics. <laughs> <to begin. laughs> I know that, but you're submitting it online, so that's uh, it's helpful, yeah, yeah. But, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the task force? I guess I have one. I'm assuming that, that, that there are, uh, there's some potential for answering some of the questions you posed with existing graduate yeah. students and, and even undergraduates. Have you found, I mean, I know that the, my sense is that the ICE program is relatively <laughs> new and it differs from campus to campus, but um, is there anyone that has sort of taken up trying to start putting together a little bit of a, a database on, on some of the questions you, you've raised? Um, not to my knowledge, but people are certainly interested in bringing, this, bringing these individual databases together so we can create this uh, more comprehensive uh, knowledge base. Any other questions? Um, I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for uh, the testimony today. And I think uh, emphasizing the point that you've done, that um, high quality research and uh, establishing a, a deeper body of knowledge around these issues, particularly with regards to how institutions of higher education, the value added that institutions Absolutely. of higher education can play, uh, that's critical and vital. And I, I should say, full disclosure, I'm a graduate of the graduate school <laughs> here at Amherst, and so I do think that that's part of when we look at the university system, that is exactly the type of research that we want to see and expect to come from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and I think can provide valuable service to the Commonwealth by, by undertaking such studies. And uh, thank you for emphasizing that point again today. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, I would say our primary concern are the parents and the students who participate in these programs, uh, they're the ultimate uh, beneficiary. So um, that's our goal. Great, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Next we have Madeline Peters, also from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and uh, she is the Director of Disability Services. We have her here, she's not here. Um, Rachel Hogan from University of Massachusetts, the ICE program coordinator. Thank you. Um, so this is brand new here at UMass, it's our first semester, and I was going to give some information about what's been going on this semester. Um, we had five students enrolled. <coughs> One had to withdraw for medical reasons. Um, the classes that they were taking were vocal performance, turf grass management, percussion, stable management, and sound design. Um, some activities <coughs> that they participated in are uh, weekly classical recitals and vocal reviews, going to the craft center, uh, library, exploring the various dining settings on campus, uh, the art galleries, conservatories and gardens, also trips to downtown Amherst, taking a bus, um, marching band practice, as you've heard, um, participation in marching band performances, and going to the rec center. Um, they also, you know, we built in some uh, social relationship kind of opportunities, I guess, um, outside what's gonna happen naturally. But, um, so they've been working with 
campus mentors four to eight hours a week, which are undergrads that I hired, um, having lunch and planning activities with members of Autism Speaks too. Um, and then for the future, I'm really happy to hear everything that Mary Lynn said. Um, but we've been exploring the high schools partnering with outside agencies to provide wraparound services that um, to support, you know, to provide the significant support that the students need to be successful here. Um, so I don't think just having them come on campuses and expecting these things to automatically happen is a, is a great plan. Um, and then also looking at bringing in the special ed department to develop and test out. Um, I have a couple examples of um, uh, areas of growth that I've seen this semester in terms of self-advocacy and um, independence and social skill mm -hmm. building. Um, one student came into the program very shy and reserved, often falling silent when asked to offer her input or decide what to eat even. Um, She's grown a great deal in this area. She's now comfortable navigating campus to get where she needs to go and leading the way on excursions during her free time. So she's making the decisions now. She's not just waiting for other people to do it. Um, she's also not only learned to budget her money and make decisions in order for herself, but she's now initiating and having conversations with other UMass students over lunch. Um, and then another student had some challenges around social relationships, not knowing how and when to start up conversations with people, and then getting frustrated by the outcomes. Um, he's made wonderful gains in this area through role playing, which have been based on real world scenarios between him and other students on campus. He not only learns from the role playing, but also just by watching other UMass students during his time with them. For example, when he's doing something like sitting and having lunch, she's an active participant, but also seems to take note of the other students' behaviors and social interactions and follow suit. Um, I have an excerpt from an email from his mother to share. Um, she sent it to me and his ed coach. So the students are all coming to campus with ed coaches too, either paraeducators from the high school or contracted out from the high school. Um, she said, I meant to tell you guys something, the student, I'm not using names, um, did last weekend at the UMass hockey game. When he came out to the car after the game, he told me he'd seen someone he knew. I asked if he'd said hello, and he said, no, they were talking to someone else. I decided to let them enjoy their conversation. I think your role playing is helping. I've never heard him express awareness of somebody else's receptiveness to conversation, prior to initiating a conversation with them. He seems to be trying to interpret social cues in a way I'd never seen him do before. I thought it was very significant and just wanted to pass it along. I think he's learning from your social skills coaching. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. Did you give me a window? Okay. <laughs> um, so I have some more testimony from faculty, but I don't know if it makes more sense for me just to submit that in writing. Or yeah, why don't you just submit that, and I, then I, I have a, I have a okay, question for you. Sure. Let's see if anybody else does. One of the things you talked about was you talked about wraparound services. Yeah. Can you just give me a little more of an idea of what you're talking about for services, who you think would be providing them and where they would provide those services. Like right, the well, that's, those are all big questions. And you know, since it's brand new, I don't really have specific answers, but I think that um, I noticed it's a, it's a big transition for these students to come here. And um, a lot of anxieties come up, a lot, and then the anxiety leads to behaviors kind of flaring up and just having some some support around the transition from high school to college, um, social skills classes. I know that you know because the mission of the ICE program is, or one of the big goals is inclusion, and that's hugely important. But I think that if we're pushing for inclusion so hard that we're leaving out the supports, saying you know we don't want all these students in one classroom together working on social skills, that's a no-no, or we don't want them all in a classroom together working on sex ed. Um, 
I think that that might be a detriment to them and um, not make this as successful as possible. They still need the scaffolding, I think, so. Um, and then in terms of who might provide that, there's an agency here in Hadley called Whole Children that we've been talking to, and they're doing all of that work with students, I think, four to 24 years old. So I'm thinking, why should we reinvent the wheel if they already have this great program that people love, just kind of bring them in, and if they're not contracting directly with UMass or with the ICE program because we want it to be as inclusive as possible so we can't offer these separate classes for students even though they need them, then they'll contract with the high schools and the high schools will work that out with them. Great, can you just keep us informed on what, how that all works out to keep us up to speed? Uh, any other questions from the, go ahead. Uh, Richard, thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, and the program that you do. Brandon. Is there, uh, and this is not something you asked in previous years, but it's a question that just came up when you were speaking. Is there a collaboration and coordination and communication with other ICE programs around the state? Yes. Okay. Yep. And how's that? Is that helpful? It's very helpful. Yep. I um, have a great relationship with Ty Hansen at HCC and also Lindsay at Westfield State. So we have this Western Mass group meeting together a lot, but I've also have been in touch with people at UMass Boston and um, Mass Bay, different schools. And that's been hugely helpful, but UMass is such a different animal. You know, it's so big compared to the other schools and just kind of figuring out how to make students comfortable navigating a campus of this size. I just think it might be beneficial at some point, somewhere for all of these director clubs to come together physically and, you know, and share what's happening on each campus because I think there's going be best practices, opportunities to collaborate. And kind of stuff. There was a statewide meeting this summer, but it was before we started, so. But yeah, I think they do that every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of a, an advocate for um, programs like dual enrollment and middle college high schools, which are programs that bring uh, university-related programs earlier on into intervention with kids that are in middle and high schools. Do you think, I mean, since these students are transitioning through the K-12 system, do you think that earlier connections or possible earlier dialogue with faculty and these students and programs that might be available on campus might be helpful to I students? I think, yeah, I think that would be hugely helpful. Yeah, just getting them as part of their high school and middle school experience, familiar Proceed. with the campus, yeah. Thanks, I just wanted to check with them if it's a, a line, a, a thread with the Yeah. Yeah, Julia. joined by Susan Senator. Um, any other questions from the task force? Go ahead. Um, right now, you said you're in your first semester here at EMS, and the classes are predominantly musical and art. Um, There's also turfgrass management and sound design. Sound design is a 300 level class. Turfgrass management, management has prerequisites, but the professor weighs them. Students are all taking the classes for audit. So, you know, they're pretty flexible about what the requirements are to fulfill the course. In the near future, do you know what the expansion for the academic classes are planned to be? Well, um, the classes that are chosen are chosen by the students based on their person-centered plan. So we go by what their interests are, what their dreams and goals are for what they want to do after coming to UMass, um, so it really depends on who comes to UMass, what, what we look at. But you know, we've been, um, I've been really careful about choosing faculty, reaching out, having face-to-face -face meetings, making sure that 
you know, they're going to be a good fit for the program because we want it to be successful. And, and I think that um, word of mouth from faculty to faculty is, is really the best way to go rather than just saying, okay, here, you know, here's a student in your class. and um, But just having the faculty talk to each other about what a great experience it's been. And I've gotten, I've had some really great um, feedback from the faculty and it's been a great experience for them too. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, next we have Lindsay Nunez, Cheryl Stanley, Trudy Knowles from Westfield State University. Everyone. I'm Trudy Knowles from Westfield State University. I am a uh, professor in the education department there. I'm going to go first because uh, because I came first. <laughs> um, two and a half years ago, I was uh, contacted by a friend of mine whose 20-year-old daughter with Down syndrome um, had a dream of going to college out in Oregon, and so she signed up for a, a class a ceramics class and 12 weeks into the class they received a letter from the president of the university kicking her out of the class because she wasn't able to handle the work and despite lobbying by every single student in that class it said we want eliza in this class she gives us a new perspective she teaches us how to see the world in new ways she's creative funny and kind and despite the student government uh, uh, petitioning on her behalf, uh, she was kicked out of that program, and it has had a huge impact on this young woman. Um, four months later, they were in Massachusetts, so I invited them to come to Westfield State to speak to some of our education students. Uh, and Eliza had an opportunity to tell her story, and it was when it was over, my students came to me and said, we have to do something. We have to start a program here to give students with intellectual disabilities the opportunity to go to college. Um, and that was a new idea for me. I mean, I'd never thought of that before. Um, but they uh, introduced me to uh, Think College folks at UMass Boston, and, and I began my research, and, uh, and somehow my name got around. I started receiving emails from parents and phone calls from parents saying my child wants to go to school. Um, I had the opportunity two, year, two and a half years ago to go to George Mason University for the State of the Art Conference, which is where I saw you last year. But, uh, and uh, student government funded three of our students to go there. When we went to student government at Westfield State, they said, you mean we don't have a program like that? That doesn't make any sense. These kids grew up with full inclusion. It makes sense to them. And so two and a half years ago, I worked all year long um, at trying to get a grant written with an incredible pushback by administrators at Westfield State and by professors who said, we don't know what to do. We can't do this. We have too many other issues. Um, and, uh, but I wasn't going to let it go. So I kept working and working. And finally, it was just seemed like it was dead. I did one last push because parents kept contacting me. We need this program, we need this program. And finally, I got an email from uh, then President Evan Dobell, who said, this is the right thing to do, we're gonna go forward with this. And if we can't house it in any other department, we're gonna house it in the President's office. And so, um, and so we did that, and we were able to get the program, finally get a grant, started working with school districts all over, um, able to hire someone to do the planning and the implementation, and we now have some students, and they're going to talk about uh, talk about that. Um, but I have a dream that we have now a regional program with UMass, HCC, and Westfield State, and that these kids have the opportunity to choose where they want to go. Um, I have a dream that that um, this program will be open to kids not just in high school, but kids any age with intellectual disabilities that want to go to college. Um, so there's a lot of uh, problems in education K-12 in this state related to high stakes testing and all that kind of stuff that we, that we can talk about later, but um, Department of Education, secondary ed, elementary and secondary ed, and the state legislature did this one right. This is a social justice issue. 
This is a civil rights issue. This is the right thing to do. And I thank you all for funding this. And I'm asking for a lot more money to keep these programs going. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Cheryl Stanley, the Dean of Education. I'm here to just say that I am sitting beside two phenomenal women. Um, I was one of those skeptics. I have a special education background, uh, but the problem, not the problem, the issue for some of us at Westville State was we just didn't know how it was going to work. We did not know how it was going to work at a four-year institution uh, because we're there for academics. Um, but what happened was Trudy's commitment and other staff commitment to make us sit down and think about it. How is this going to work? We were able to hire Lindsay Noon, who is our program coordinator, who I say is the new sheriff in town <laughs> at Westville State, and to sit down and really come up with a program that is working. And so I am so happy to say that I was a turnaround woman because of Dr. Knowles' commitment and because of Professor, or I'm sorry, of Lindsay Knowles, uh, who will soon be a professor, uh, because of her experience and background and because of all of us now rallying together to say, we can do this. So thank you for allowing me to say that I did turn around and that also to say that Westfield is so happy to have this program on, their, on its campus. Thank you. We planned this in a chronological order, but we're sitting out of it. <laughs> so I am the program coordinator at Westfield State. Um, a little background on kind of I was hired on September 1st and students arrived on campus on the 4th. So not only was I trying to acclimate then six students to the campus, I couldn't tell them anything other than where the bathrooms were. It was really, and I, I had them and we thought, okay. So the first few weeks were rocky and Cheryl saw me in some of my lowest moments. But we, we now have five students enrolled in the fall, we'll have 10 in the spring. And we have students in human biology, two different music classes, a history post-1865, and intro to exercise science and relaxation techniques. So our students really have a wide range. I'm not sure what spring will be yet because we're still in the registration process. We, we ran into a bump where all of our clubs meet after the hours of students are on campus, which was really difficult then trying to provide an inclusive college life when a lot of students are sleeping during the day if they're going to class. So we, we started kind of looking, okay, what can we do? We can find peers, we can provide opportunities, and really just getting them out there. And as we've talked about, we had pushback from faculty, not for any reason other than fear. This is new, this is different. I have five great faculty professors now and I already have professors saying, yes, please, we've heard from so-and-so, this is going to be great. But we've kind of flipped our approach of how we're getting it to faculty and we're making them realize that the students on campus, it's, it's normal, it's okay for them. Our students, the campus population in general are so welcoming to our students. And so one story that happened the very first day was we were in front of our <laughs> building and one of our students, he's very loving, and he's jumping around and he's yelling, take pictures of me, I'm in college. And a typical peer is walking by, he has the baggy pants and he has this little e-cigarette because Westfield's so free. And he just looks at me and it was a long day. He goes, do they go here? And I stopped I said, yeah, yeah, they do. And he goes, that's absolutely amazing and wicked awesome. <laughs> and I looked and I go, you're right. You are right. And he was like, so what is it? So I start telling him about the program and his smile, he's just getting this huge smile, and he's like, where do I sign up? How can I be a peer mentor? I mean, at this point, I, I wanted peer mentors, I didn't know how. And he was like, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow, I'll have lunch. He had lunch with our students every day for two weeks, started bringing friends over. We now have over 50 peers who spend 
all day with our students, doing all sorts of different things. Some do tutoring, some just go to lunch. They're asking me if they can come there on the weekends. I mean, things that I, I haven't even started to fathom how I'm going to manage now my students for <laughs> another 50 and more. Student government just sent me a list of 12 names of students that are interested. So I'm really just saying that the students now who are going to college, this is, this is what they're used to. They are not gonna have it any other way, so we just need to get the people who aren't used to it ready for it because this is the way that's coming. And that's kind of, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Awesome. That was pretty exciting testimony. <laughs> uh, any questions from the task force? Go ahead. Um, I started, I'm really lucky my office is in the education department and if I have to say if you've never visited Westfield State, you need to meet the education department. I'm in school with my doctorate and want to be a professor and I, just since working there, they are so welcoming and I started going to their classes and saying, and they all agreed because some students needed free practicum hours and different things and they were like, you know, you, you could do this because a lot of people go to school to be teachers of the little kids the younger ones with special needs. No one's really ever thinking about, oh, they get older. I wanna be a high school teacher. I wanna, I wanna teach post kind of 22. So I really, we really went to those students to say, look, they're, they're, here's an opportunity. I got a few from those classes. Then we put up some flyers and it was all word of mouth. And it's, we had some money set aside in the grant. I had students tell me, I absolutely, I do not wanna be paid for this. They're my friends. I'm not taking the money. So we've already said we are not putting that back in the budget. And we're gonna use the money for parties. <laughs> during, during the day, not like parties. <laughs> like pizza parties, things like that. I'm glad you clarified. Yeah, we're going to get to the public experience, but not like mine. <laughs> Other questions, Susan? skill development and employment because the end result is that we are training them for their life dream or their their employment area and so when you talk about no we don't turn anyone down but if we cannot provide that that program for them that will fit their life's dream then we we, we have to have a conversation with parent and the student and their uh, their specialists that that we work with so no and yes, because we want to be able to provide that program for their end goal. I, know, I, just, um, I know that Trudy has said that the one day the, the dream would be to include all students with intellectual disabilities. Well, that's my dream. <laughs> I, I don't know that. Keep that dream. Yeah. Yeah. What was there? A, there was there a question associated. Well, that's why I was saying that you know that I hope I hope that there might be a plan you know from 
other administrator's perspective that um, that you might be able to someday include some of those more of those students all the way down at the end of the spectrum. I don't like to say down, but there's no other way to and, and it would still be a set of criteria yeah. that that we would go by to just as you would with any college student who had a set of criteria to be admitted to a program. Mm -hmm. I think with the right supports too, but I mean we're still maybe about fourteen weeks in. It feels like it's been forever. But I think with the right supports and kind of structures in place, eventually all students will come. And it's going to happen. I mean I right out of college worked at a school that had three students and when I left we had twelve and it was a chapter seven six six school and it was really it was what they needed. But there's no reason why that school in a sense cannot I'm a strong believer in community based instruction. So we are they're gonna be on our campus one day. It might not be next semester, but it as long as I'm at Westfield they're coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? Can I just ask a question? I'm glad that you brought up the uh, the matter of um, employment issues because I think that um, we spend an awful lot of time talking about being academic and career ready, and uh, that we're looking at that with all students who are um, coming into higher education. What, what what does the education pay to do? And um, in addition to just expanding what students know on. Um, learned from our, from our classes. Um, my question is this, what kinds of um, career readiness I interventions or strategies are you associating with what you're doing right now? And it, um, that doesn't mean that you have to have those in place already, but I'm just curious to see how you're thinking about that. So um, we have a great career center on campus and one of the career counselors there has actually taken a really believes in the mission of ICE and he meets with all of our students almost weekly or bi-weekly and he's been doing a lot of vocational assessments um, in the spring so these are just kind of basic strategies in the spring we are going to do kind of ICE classes where we're going to bring in different people who will match kind of employability things interviewing um, how to dress for an interview we have already started placing students in campus internship types of um, based on their interests so we're not just putting them anywhere I've turned down some offers because they really didn't match any of our students at the time and we have an employment specialist who districts can choose to use our employment specialist or if they have someone in their district to place them because the students should be working in their home community we have students from Amherst it, it's not reasonable that if they're working in Westfield that post 22 they're gonna be able to get down to Westfield to work so we really look at in their home community so we start with kind of an on-campus internship, start building those skills, and the goal is to get them paid and planted before they leave our program. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a really quick question. Can you, uh, you didn't have a lot of time to recruit faculty to or introduce these students to. Any problems there? I mean, you have a nice sort of diversity of, of subjects that the students have expressed interest in. Uh, how, how did that process go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just want to say a couple things. One thing one thing we did was we brought uh, Maria Krywanski <laughs> down from UMass Boston, who did a training with all interested faculty at like a faculty center. So you had thing. already identified. Okay. But good. but those are not necessarily the faculty that Lindsay's working with. Yeah. And then we did another training this fall for faculty. And how about Laura? She working with the individual. So um, also one of our professors who she will be acting chair in the spring, she is, um, really side note, the first peer mentor, she was his principal in elementary school, I forgot to mention that, of an inclusion school. So she's really um, into kind of universal design, so she has reached out to faculty and saying she'll provide one-on-one -on -one support to them to make, because they hear from me, and I'm just this new person on campus they need to hear from a colleague who they've grown to respect and work with so she is providing kind of one-on-one -on -one consultation if they reach for it and we have started um, we're going to be visiting every department meeting in some way some of them are starting with blurbs but we're not they've realized we're not going away in a sense because they finally they're responding to emails and so we started with the faculty who were interested and now we uh, we actually have a four-year plan kind of being drafted of how we plan to have every faculty member on board. Thank you. Julia? Um, it sounds phenomenal. I mean, it's so exciting to hear all of your testimony. As you were planning and developing 
was how important was whatever kind of assistance you got from Institute for Community Inclusion, UMass Boston, or the other colleges, and how important do you think that is for other universities who want to move forward in the same direction? I'll start by saying the first thing I did was call Ty Hansen at ACC. That was the first thing I did. This was two and a half years ago, and it was just like this is my idea. And then, and then contacting the uh, people at the what is it Center for Inclusive whatever. I, I never know the ICI, ICU. I don't know where. Um, and 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 so their money is dried up a little more. So they they used to provide free consultation, traveling all over the place, and that money's dried up, which makes it a little bit harder for us to to get them to come to Westfield State. So. I, I mean, all of that, that kind of regional collaboration is just key. It's just really key. So do you think that kind of assistance, if there were more resources, would be useful for you and other new universities? I think absolutely. And the other thing our university said, and I don't know if it's still true, is you've got to self-fund this. We have no money to give you, so you've got to get this money. It's got to be its own money maker, basically. <laughs> And so if, if money dries up, then, you know, what are we going to do with our program? Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Ludmilla Pavlova. Sorry, Pavlova. That's fine. My name is Mila Pavlova Kilum, and I live here in Amherst. I'm a staff member at the University of Campus Planning. I'm an architect. Um, I am also a member of the um, CPAC group, which is Special Education um, Parent Advisory Group. Um, I have two children. One is 22 in the graduate program here in microbiology, and one is 10, and he's in Wildwood Elementary School and is a beneficiary of the special education system. Um, he has some developmental delays that mostly have to do with neurological issues and his body and spatial um, issues. Um, <coughs> he's received wonderful support through the public school system. Um, is very smart, very bright, and has um, social issues that his team is working with him on. He's, his brother is a great mentor to him, and so I expect that he will expect that himself and hope to get a college education. He's already taking um, MOOC classes on computer science because he's really interested in computer science. And um, I'm concerned that we, as a state and as an institution, should s extend more resources towards addressing the program programming issues that support inclusivity and access to higher education in the same way that we have spent in the country and in the state a great deal of money in um, addressing accessibility in the capital infrastructure that we put in place. As an architect, I'm well aware of how much money we always have to spend whenever we renovate our buildings to address accessibility issues because they're important and critical to providing access to the whole life cycle of a human being. <coughs> to our institutions and our civic institutions and to higher education, of course. And that has done some, um, a great deal sort of to improve the diversity of our <coughs> staff on campus. We have many different kinds of disabilities that are now quite easily adapted to, and we have the benefits of the performance of these wonderful thinkers and um, practitioners. And in the same way, we should spend time to invest in people and developing programs <coughs> that take advantage of the inclusivity we've built into our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So supporting higher education um, sort of response to the very specific needs of students <coughs> who have that as a great passion in their life <coughs> is something that's very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. <laughs> Um, next, we're going to have a member of our task force um, himself testify, Brian Heffernan, and he is also going to be joined by his mom, Julia Heffernan, and they'll <coughs> testify together. So, Good 
Good morning. Um, thank you for having us here. I'm really glad we have a chance to speak now because you've heard from a lot of colleges and up higher institutions wondering how it can be done. You've heard from a parent now wondering what the future holds for her child. And so here I am to tell you some great stories about what inclusion has done for Brian. I'll tell you a little bit about high school and then he can tell you about his experiences at Mass Bay Community College. Um, Brian is my oldest child. I have three children. Brian is just about to turn 23. He has a sister who's just about to turn 20, who's a sophomore at Haverford College, and he has a sister who's just about to turn 18, who's a senior at Newton North High School. Brian went to Newton um, Public Schools. He was <coughs> fully included all the way through. When he got to high school, um, Newton being such a large high school, Newton North had a variety of levels. You could take special ed classes, then there were many levels of um, classes. You could take Curriculum 2, Curriculum 1, Honors, AP. Brian, they decided when he went into high school that he should be fully included. Um, I should add here, I'm also an English teacher, and my husband and Brian bond over sports, and they are in, I can't even tell you how many sports leagues and sports activities. <laughs> Brian and I bond over reading. He is my reading buddy, and he has been since he was a baby. Um, and so out of that, Brian loves stories. He loves characters. He loves plots. He loves twists. And so um, the courses that he loves the most are his English courses and his history courses. When he was in high school, as I say, he was put in curriculum two classes. Soon after the school year began, the English teacher contacted us and contacted the authorities, the, the administration in the school, and said, Brian knows these stories better than the other kids in the class, and these are kids who did not have disabilities. Brian knows the characters, Brian's read the stories. I would like to bump Brian up to Curriculum 1. So coming out of the school, Brian was bumped up to Curriculum 1 for English and History. Um, one other story that I think is significant is in Newton, um, you have to, your junior year, you have to do a junior thesis. This is an all-year project for juniors <coughs> in high school. Because Brian was fully included, he needed to do a thesis. The special ed department thought they were doing him a favor by saying, you know what, we talked to them, you only have to write a couple paragraphs. And Brian said, that's not what I want to do. I want to do a junior's thesis. Because for him, it was about the learning experience. It wasn't a writing assignment. And so Brian chose to do his junior thesis on the Titanic. He wrote letters to the Titanic um, Historical Association. He wrote, let, we visited museums. He read books that he was capable of reading on his own. We read books together that needed my help in reading them. Um, and he spent months on it, as did the other juniors. At the end, he had a 12-page paper. And he and I helped him with the <coughs> writing, and the teacher was fully aware of that. Two years later, our family went to Ireland. We went to the Titanic Museum. Brian still remembered all the details. And now it's been over five years, and Brian remembers the details. So I think that the emphasis was the learning experience, not that he wrote that paper entirely by himself, because he didn't. But you can question him afterwards, and he can still tell you about who was on the Titanic. Um, but anyway, my point is, with that level of interest in learning, there had to be something next. The other thing I need to tell you about high school is that Brian's main activity was theater. He loves theater, always has, again, the stories. So his freshman year, he found he could get involved by ushering in every single production, which he did. But they loved him, they saw his interest, so they said, you need to be on stage. In 10th grade, they did a production that everybody in the, um, in the cast read from the script. Nobody had memorized the script, and so Brian had a role in that. He loved it. Then they said, you know what, you really need to be in the bigger productions. So in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, he was in the musicals, um, and his part in the musicals got bigger every year. In uh, 10th grade, it was West Side Story. In 11th grade, it was Grease. And in senior year, it was Anything Goes. And by that year, Brian was, um, right before the intermission, they also had their big number. So Brian was part of that big tap dance number, and he got every step. And that was a testimony to Brian, certainly, but also to the school and to the way they invested in him. The other reason I mentioned theater is because Brian was so involved in theater, so many of his friends did not have disabilities. So what they talked about at practice was you know, preparing for college, what tests they were taking for college, where they were going to college, the college application. So it seemed like that was the next step for Brian. Um, and so we had to dig around. It wasn't offered to us. It wasn't made apparent in our transition meetings. But we found, we heard about the ICE program. My husband called Representative Sonicondro. And we, we heard about it, and it seemed like the perfect fit. Brian's going to tell you more about that, but I do want to tell you three quick things about college. One, um, 
he is, again, he's in academic classes. He started auditing them, but then he started to take them for credit. Um, he loves the classes. He doesn't like the class this semester because he said, Mom, the kids don't participate. They don't do the work. And so he's the only one participating in class. So this is like ninth grade all over again. He loves the learning experience. Um, a second thing I want to tell you is he wanted to get involved in activities. He wanted to join the clique club. They didn't have one. We didn't know this, but unbeknownst to us, Brian went to the director of student services and said, how do I start a clique club? She said, well, you have to have a petition. He had the petition. He took it around. He got hundreds of signatures. Took it back. She said, okay, now you have to get a faculty advisor. He went around. He found a faculty advisor. And so he did the work. We didn't even know this was happening. And at the end of the year, that club won the best new club. Um, and the third story, which I'll end with, is that somebody asked, well, what, you know, what do parents get out of this? Is there, is there value in this? One of the pieces for Brian, he has, along with the classes, he has meaningful employment. He'll tell you about that. And now his internship has been in Boston. We live just outside of Boston. Brian has learned to take public transportation first to Mass Bay, but now he takes it into Boston by himself, which was frightening to me. Um, but he was, he was fine with it. About a month ago, he usually comes home between 2.30 and 3.30 in the afternoon. I was watching the clock. It was 2.30. He was not home. It was 2.30. 45, he was not home. About 3 o'clock, I texted him. He did not respond to my text. About 3.15, 3.30, I called him. He did not respond to my call. So I was very nervous. It was about two hours before that Brian was missing, in my mind. Um, he should have been home. So at that point, I walked toward the bus station. I was worried. I didn't know what else to do. I couldn't get in touch with him. As I neared the bus station, the bus stop, he came around the corner and he was grinning from ear to ear. And I said, Brian, where have you been? And he said, look at me. Don't you see my haircut? And I said, what? He said, I got off the bus a few stops early so I could get my haircut. And I just stared at him and I said, did you have money for it? He said, well, like, sure. I stopped at the bank on the, way to, on the way to work. And so then I said, well, what did you do? Did you just wait around till a bus came and you were hoping that a bus would pick you up? He said, no, I know the way. I walked home. And as he told me, the neighbors who were outside raking their lawns, I learned that not only did he walk home, but he walked home in the most circuitous route. Um, and it wasn't just the main roads. And this level of independence, this planning, this going to the bank, this realizing that he needs a haircut and going to get it, and this walking home, this is all a very direct byproduct of the ICE program. Hi, I'm Brian Heffman. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. As my mom said, <laughs> <laughs> I am Gus Drum, my fifth year at Mass Bay Community College. Well, I take one course a semester. So far, I take all communication, intro film, intro mass media, criminal justice, American history, principal's marketing, two acting classes, and now sociology. Sometimes I audit my classes, and sometimes I take them for a grade. Last year, I got an A in my acting class. I think my professor really liked my monologues. <laughs> Last week, you heard Damien Finstein, director of Mass Bay's Princess and Merch Goss program. Speak. She helped me choose my courses. Recently, she told me that she thinks I am capable of earning a degree from Mass Bay, looking at my transcript, and considering my interest. I have decided to mention communications. As you can see. <laughs> <laughs> I have an echo for attention class with me and helps me take notes. Later, I take the notes into my laptop. Mom. <laughs> my laptop has a full folder called Curse Wild, which means the notes back me as I take them and when I want to study them. When I'm not in class or working on my homework, I go to the computer lab to check my email, I hang out in the cafeteria with my friends, or I go to the recreation center to work out. I, as my mom also said, I started a story club at Mass Bay, and we run the World for Professional Club in our first year. Also, I served on the Student Government Association last year. When I started Mass Bay, I learned how to use public transportation. I have a traffic coach who worked with me at first, but now I'm capable, but now I'm able to do it all by myself. I now work in Boston three days a week, and I take public transportation to that job too, even though the streets of Boston are very busy. I have a lot of job experience, 
I used to work at the Newton Free Library for books and movies. I also worked at Newton City Hall delivering mail. I've worked as a bagger at Stars for more than two years, and I work at Fairway Park during the baseball season. I also do a lot of public speaking. I have spoken in tours. I am a regular speaker for Newton Elementary Schools for the Disability Awareness Program for Unstaying Our Doses. Last year, I was given Unstaying Our Doses Inspirational Speaker Award. I also speak at local courses, including Mass Bay, Boston University, Brandeis, and Harvard. For the last year and a half, I have started an institute at Mac, which truly is one of my supervisors, which stands for Mass Actors for Children. I do office work, speak at workshops, and I go to the state house to lobby for bills that have to do with disabilities. I have spoken to less leaders about funding for the ICE program, and I successfully lobbied for more funding to train teachers to help students with disabilities transfer to adulthood. I even got to stand by Governor Patrick's side as he signed that bill into law, and Governor, former Governor Dukakis, when he gave you, when he gave Tom a award. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Oh. <laughs> By the way, I have a website, BrianSpeaksToYou.com. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, listed on my business card. If you're interested, thanks for having me. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Any questions? That was great. Thank you both for coming and testifying. Thank you. Uh, next we have Joseph. Oh, are you <coughs> testifying today? Or? No. Yes. All right, Joseph and Denise Grasty, who are parents. We'd we like to ask Ms. Nelson to come up too. Surprise? You know, I just messed with y'all, you know, just I proved people wrong. I passed all my MCATs, even physics. 
What would my second grade teacher think if she knew I earned advanced on the ELAM test? <laughs> I worked hard and my attitude improved. I made student of the month. My dream in middle school was to play basketball like my dad. I wanted to make him proud, but I was not given an opportunity. At Hampton Charter School of Science, my high school, Coach Trudeau gave me a fighting chance. I practiced and prepared for the tryouts. I made jump shots and three pointers. Coach Trudeau said, I like your style, Grassy. I made the team. I'm number 20. This past season, we won six games and lost 12. I learned from losing. We can only get better by trying harder. My passion is to be a race car driver or to work in the automotive industries. Jeff Gordon's number 24 DuPont Chevrolet was fast, colorful, bright, and awesome. And when you are four and have an autistic mind, things click instantly. I loved racing when I was four and still love it at the age of 17. I know all the statistics of NASCAR. I can tell you all the wins of Jimmy Johnson, 66, Gail Sr., 76, King Richard Petty, 200, Jeff Gordon, 88, Dale Jr., 19. This is where my autism kicks in to help me remember everything. I love my autism. It helps me remember my passions. As a person, I would be incomplete without my autism. My passion for racing and my need to be part of a team. The next step is to be a college student. College is going to be hard. It is an opportunity to meet new people, gain independence, and to teach people about autism. Autism provides you with a memory unlike any other. Autism gives me intensity and gives me hope. So um, to give you a little background, like you said, I knew Joe pretty much introduced himself. Um, and it was a struggle. And I think that new parents of a child with autism not knowing what it was. I mean, I was devastated. My wife was devastated when we were told about it. There was no information around in the inner city, none at all. None whatsoever. I think the most I heard about autism was uh, Doug Foley on TV, you know, which was not explanatory, but his son had autism. We still didn't know what it was. Um, I think that as we went on, the challenges that we ran in, there was not a lot of support. There was actually some rejection. In fact, um, we didn't have something for that child, so they were pretty much, you know, find a way to kind of move us along and move out of the way. Um, being fighters, as you can tell, my son's a fighter just like I am, my, my wife is, so being a fighter, and you can't tell us no, because we'll turn on no into yes. Um, I think the biggest thing was is that experience the fact that uh, Joe's program was so hard for, uh, you know, the inner city schools because of exclusion and he wanted to be excluded. That was my goal. So we fought. We fought everybody. I mean, we challenged as many people as we possibly could. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was is the lack of information. Lack of information in the communities, lack of information in school, um, lack of information just all around as, as a whole. Um, so one of the things that I did along the way, you know, as Joe got better and we found, thank God, we found out uh, the school and Ms. Nelson and all the faculty and the staff there, it's been an excellent experience. Inclusion is an excellent experience. And, and, and one of the things I said before I'd like to say again is, is that our children are our children. They're human beings just like we are. You know, they have the same rights we do. And when we deprive, deprive, them, to deprive them of those rights, they know it. They feel it. They feel it. And all that does is exclude them even more. Um, I had the pleasure of working for <coughs> the Sheriff's Department out here for uh, almost 19 years, and at least a third of the population that I deal with, the young men and women that I deal with, have some kind of special need, and it just was never identified or, you know, what happened. And, and it's amazing, so it kind of really helped me, inspire me to work with Joe. Well, of course, I'm a father, so I'm going to work on him anyways. But, I mean, it just inspires me to kind of really push to help people um, to, to build a better uh, informational system to set up to help kids with, with autism um, and all disabilities. Uh, I just want to add one more thing. I just want to say that fortunate enough along the way we speak enough, or we talk enough, we should say, because we don't speak anywhere. We talk enough to people that people who know Joe's love and his passion for NASCAR, we've been everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. We've been meat drivers, tweet drivers, you name it, so it builds on. So our goal is, is to try to get Joe in higher education in a program that meets his needs, you know, to make him a better person so he can have a full inclusion experience 
like every you know student coming out of high school. Also, uh, one of the things that I did do and um, I started to do is yes, I kind of did with a couple of speakers and guys of having an internship program, an inclusion program early on in high school to prepare these kids to go into college. They should be visiting campuses before they go on, so it takes away from that shock. Um, so I did start, you know, try to make an attempt to start a program with one of the colleges in uh, Springfield to uh, get an internship program to start that it didn't quite go well. But I think it's so important to partnership with the colleges in the area to get the kids up on the you know the campuses, to walk them around, to bring them to lunch, to introduce them to the students, you know, before they even embark upon coming in as a, a student at the school. So with that I'll close. And so one of our our main goal today is that we really um, appreciate Robin being here. Joseph's gonna be the first autistic child to graduate in the Charter School of Science. And there's many more children that she'll have that uh, with special needs, so we want Robin to get more information on the ICE program, to get more information from the task force, um, so that we can continue to find the way for him to Charter School of Science. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the task force? Uh, I, I was, I was um, particularly touched by the fact in the essay that um, Joe chose to particularly point out his second grade teacher telling him that he would never learn to, to read. And I'm, I'm just thinking that, um, again, as we uh, prepare practitioners to be in, in classrooms and whatever, I think that there's a lot that we can learn about how things that happen in the lives of children when as early as the second grade can have such lasting impacts that he would now reference back to that writing his essay to college having done exactly the opposite of what the teacher said he was going to do. So I think that this, this is illustrative of how important these conversations are and how important it is for us to continue to learn and to grow from these experiences uh, and what these students have to teach us. We learn that if He's picking up this. Imagine what's happening to everyone that's sitting in the classroom on just simple comments that may be said and what's actually retained and carried with students over the course of their experiences. So I really want to thank the family and you, Robin, as well, for taking the time to sit down with them and the great work that you've done in helping uh, Joe to develop into the outstanding student that I'm sure that he's going to be. I just want to say that, just one thing is that, um, we get a lot of students who are in substantially separate programs that come to our school and then they're in a smaller school environment with more supports and we're a college preparatory school, no doubt. There's, our population of special needs students is lower than the state average, but it's higher than the national average. And, um, you know, there is a right school for every student. I think that's, and not saying that our school's right for every student, but I'm saying that there is a right school for every student. And Joe came in with the MCAS alternative on his plan, and we decided as a team to make, to try, just try the regular MCAS. And here he is now, he's passed every, every MCAS. You know, advanced, and you know, this is something that we didn't even think was possible when he first came to our school. So I just think we have to look at our students give them the accommodations they need, and but also know that they can, many of them, most of them, hopefully all of them, can really be successful, and more successful than we even think they can be. Mm -hmm. Susan. And um, to me, the, the mother of a 24-year-old with severe autism, I think your message of how, or you know, Joe's message actually, um, of, of how his autism is uh, something that enhances him and it is, doesn't make him lesser at all. He is talked about his sharp mind clicking in instantly and he knows that that's his, from his autism and his memory and I just love that. That he has given me a lot of, you know, for my son in, in the future because you never know. Um, and I, I just thank you for, you know, bringing that to us. I just want, I just want to just go out to that too is that it's really, one of the things that I know, because I work in human services so good, I keep on seeing people, so I learn the techniques, and I'm really all to the person. So one of the things that I've always um, encouraged teachers and my wife and 
myself to do is to cave through the strengths. You know, I mean, use his strengths to help him to learn or to involve, involve into a, a better person or a better, you know, into a better situation. And it works. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> Can I just add one last footnote? Um, there's two things that you said that I did take notes on that I think are, are worth for us uh, thinking about as we go forward. One of which is that we need to look more carefully about how these awareness of these programs and support services are available in urban districts and in places where sometimes um, these services might not be available. And then secondly, the thing that you said as a result of the work you've done in the criminal justice systems with young people who are finding themselves in the criminal justice systems, that there may be a number of these young people who are suffering from uh, misdiagnosis of issues that may have been, had they been detected earlier, might not have led them into uh, circumstances that result with now being involved in a complicated problem on top of their already problem of now being in the judicial system and having to deal with that. So I think those are two good things for us to think about and where deeper analysis and better research may be able to help us uh, do some things in the future that we're not doing right now. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next, we have Ty Hansen from Holyoke Community College. started with the ICE program eight years ago when the initiative was very, very young and clear was the only campus in Western Mass offering these opportunities to our students in the area. I'm very proud to say that we have been able to serve over 80 students from over 10 sending districts over the past eight years here in Western Mass. And we so welcome the opportunity now to work with UMass Amherst and Westfield State University to offer even more opportunities to our students and our families in the area. I have some partners with me today, and I have some wonderful testimonial from them as well, so I'd like to include them as, a, as really as a collaborative, um, because this work has been truly a partnership, and I believe the success and the reason that we've become a fully self-sustained program is because of the partnerships that we have with our sending districts and our area agencies. Um, had it not been through the efforts of um, the Mass Advocates for Children, the Institute for Community Inclusion, and Tom Sanicandro's amazing support and legislative um, financial conduit, um, it really has brought us to this place where we can now share. Um, Massachusetts was the first state in the nation to offer this initiative, and I'm very proud to say that we're now in over 30 states across the nation, and we've just jumped across the pond. Um, both. Sweden and Ireland are very interested and excited by the work that was accomplished here in the state of Massachusetts. So little did we know that eight years ago, we would come so far and be able to reach so many students. Um, in terms of some of the testimonials, Catherine Mahoney is here with us today. She's a special education program coordinator at the Westville Public Schools. And she says, we at the Westville Public Schools cannot emphasize strongly enough the importance of having opportunities for each student to continue to explore their potential after high school. The ICE program gives them this opportunity and a new environment, and because of this, we've seen growth that is both exciting and often unexpected. Also with us today is Dr. Joyce Butler, who is a professor here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and she says, this out-of-district placement is the best deal in town given the level of program support and the development of independence and self-determination in our students. Participation in college courses at HCC helps students achieve their post-secondary vision and meets the needs of both the students and the school district's transition goals. A dear friend of mine is also in the audience, and that's Sherry Elander. She's a transition specialist at Westfield High School, and she says, 
the life-changing experiences that occur when students are given the right to participate in self-discovery experiences with same age peers in a post-secondary setting is remarkable. I believe it is a right and not a privilege. As we continue to go through this journey, I was having a conversation with um, some of our wonderful colleagues at the Institute for Community Inclusion. I said, I wonder if it's time to start putting pen to paper on volume two of Think College. And I look at this opportunity today in this forum um, as maybe an opportunity to start thinking about what are the next steps. We have established post-secondary inclusive programs here in our Commonwealth and it's now spreading across the nation. But there's a few topics that I continue to wrestle with and it keeps me up at night. Um, one of the things that I would love to have a public discussion around is how could regional transition centers be developed to share resources for those smaller school districts? And how can we link students with post-school supports and services while maintaining high expectations for their employment, like the high expectations we've had for their education? And also, what innovative practices can now be adopted by our vocational rehab and developmental disability agencies to maintain the level of community inclusion our students have experienced while they've been in college? So I thank you for this opportunity, and I welcome you back to Western Massachusetts. It's great to have you in our zip code. Thank you very much. Don't jump away yet. Um, any questions? Susan. I just wanted to respond to your very last comment about the agencies that deal with adulthood. Um, the organization I work for, which is the Community College Consortium for Autism and Intellectual Disabilities, is lobbying now on a federal level to try to get some of the Medicaid rules changed so that the Medicaid money that goes to DAHAB program might actually go towards programs like this. So that when you no longer have the IDEA funding, you now have this other funding stream that can really help out some of these students who really don't belong in a the day have. Exactly. These students have had this fully inclusive experience and have truly become a part of our community. And then to ask them to go back into a substantially separate program or substantially separate employment. Your knowledge just ends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, oh, sir. You, you mentioned uh, you're now a fully uh, self-sustained program. I don't know a lot about the funding of the uh, program. Can you tell, tell sure. a little about how you were able to do that? Absolutely. So um, eight years ago, back in 2007, was when the first pilot funds were um, released in the state of Massachusetts. And we were given a charge back then, knowing that um, we were really on a five-year plan to become fully self-sustained. So in year one, we were 100% funded, um, and it was a wonderful opportunity for um, the colleges and the associated sending districts to really have this opportunity to have that, that financial cushion to explore and experiment and create and develop a really innovative program without any financial risk. And then each year, approximately, there was a reduction of about a 20% decrease each year. And in the first three years, we were able to still be able to run our program just grant funded. Um, but because we knew that our charge was to become fully self-sustained, um, very early on, even in year one, we began to have conversations with our partners about um, how we could become a, a fully self-sustained program. And so we developed a memorandum of agreement with our sending districts. And each year as the funding was reduced, we asked our sending districts to start taking on a smaller piece. Um, so by the end of year three, our districts were aware that in year four, they were going to have to contribute a portion, and then in year five, a larger portion, and then in year six, we were no longer on the grant, and we were fully self-sustained through a memorandum of agreement with our districts. And is it three districts that are principally your sending districts? Um, well, we have worked with 10 districts okay. throughout Western Mass. Okay. Thank you. I think you alluded to this in, in your remarks, which are great. Thank you. Um, do the districts find it cost effective 
in terms of other services? It's a couple of leading questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I will quote a, a colleague of mine in the room who said um, that we are the best deal in town. If you look at the cost per pupil, we on average run 6700 a year is the cost per pupil to be a part of the ICE program at HCC. In addition to that, sending districts also need to um, support students with an educational coach. Um, on average, most districts are able to use one coach for every two students. Um, so that cost to the district is oftentimes substantially less than an out-of-district placement that could be upwards of $75,000 a year for a student um, with this level of need. I think that's, I think that, so for those of us, and I've had this conversation with lots of people, people don't understand the cost of a special education system that works now, and I know we had that with Mass Bay Community College, and they were saying, I forgot what they said, like three or something, three to six thousand dollars a year, um, and I know Rich Dowry's <laughs> seeing that the cost of, a, of educating a student in the, the systems that we currently use for these students between 18 and 22, you use the number of $75,000. Probably at the low end, we're probably talking 30000 plus a lot of these school districts have to spend another 10000 to get these kids to those schools. So the numbers on the other side, when you don't use this type of program that we've been discussing since we've been here is multiples more expensive to do what we're considering or lots of folks are considering a less meaningful and useful system to educate students. It makes great fiscal sense and as a UMass Amherst grad of the Eisenberg School of Management here, <laughs> it's a good fit. Great plug. <laughs> Go ahead. I like that. Just so it's not that in there. <laughs> Under the wires. That's all I have. Thank you. Shall I have a question? I was going to say, uh, relative to, to this uh, kind of economic analysis of the system delivery structures, uh, has there been any really uh, thoughtful look at that? I mean, versus sending students to, say, private setting situations versus the, the ones that we're talking about now, and whether or not the value added to what we're doing to ICD as opposed to other systems, or is that a, 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 in another area of research that we can take a look at? We started to dabble with it, and actually we've written quite a few research briefs with our colleagues at the Institute for Community Inclusion, so there's a lot of great, really educational research and journaling that's going on through the Think College um, website and organization. They just had a major national conference in Washington, D.C. last weekend. <coughs> Um, they also just piloted um, a fabulous new documentary. It's a 30-minute documentary called Rethinking College. And um, they've been the powerhouse to really help us move this initiative um, nationally and internationally. So I feel very fortunate to be in collaboration with them because they've done a wonderful job of you know, really getting the information out through um, professional research journals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we are running very, very short on time. I do have, I have Jim Nash from, it says Frontier, and then I also have Brian Crutzier, also from Frontier. I don't know if you're planning to testify together or, yes. <laughs> you can come up together, that'll save the travel time anyway. I actually have another name here, but it doesn't say Frontier. I don't know if that's the first name. Ben Austin. I'll do that. He's the associate director. Okay. Great. We're living a bit here. My name is Jim Nash. I work for an agency called CareerWorks, and I am Brian's ed coach, and you are? I am Brian Quetzler. And what are you doing here? I do tour for management. I do tour for management. Yeah, I do all sorts of things. 
Here's your seat. I found the iPhone to, to, to a pretty interesting learning tool. I like learning how turf grow into the ground, how it has seeds and roots. I am learning how to be a good friend and role model. I am learning to develop relationships and how to talk to people. I am also learning um, interaction with more people. I am learning to choose what I want. I like the rec center attending performances at the fine arts center, taking the bus to Amherst and walking back. I enjoy the campus center, the library, student union, and Whitmore. Uh, I have fun eating with people and having conversations. I like attending, attending UMass hockey and basketball. I look forward to, um, to uh, ice skating, swimming, and studying landscaping, biology, and sports management. I look forward to talking to Rachel and share about the classes I want to be taking. Thank you, Brian. So again, my name is uh, Jim Nash. Um, I work for a small nonprofit in Northampton and provide vocational programming. And also, because of our background in the way we are able to provide community-based programming, uh, CareerWorks has been uh, an effective service for different school systems to provide and coach supports for students. Um, my background with uh, working with ICE programs goes back to working with the HCC ICE program, uh, where I've uh, partnered with uh, Maureen Conroy, Ty Hansen, uh, Catherine Mahoney. Uh, uh, I've had uh, the, the honor of working with Kristen Mecca and Kelly Jarvis, two of the greatest head coaches uh, with, uh, within the HCC um, uh, program. Um, I, Career Works also had the um, the honor of working with uh, Maria Piwanski, uh, which helped develop the uh, Ed Coach Agreement, which is, a, which is a great tool for establishing a relationship between the student and the school. Um, and I'm also here today as Brian's Ed Coach. Um, I'd like to, um, last spring there was a um, article in the Gazette, a local paper. The headline said, firms seek grads with soft skills, who can think fast, work in teams. The world's top employers are pickier than ever, and they, and they want to see more than high marks and the right degree. They want graduates with so-called soft skills, those who can work well in teams, write and speak with clarity, adapt quickly, quickly to changes in technology and business conditions, and interact with colleagues from different countries and cultures. Um, I'd like to um, I'd like to now refer to uh, the Mass Work-Based Learning Book that outlines the following skills that I consider soft skills. Attendance and punctuality, workplace appearance, accepting direction and constructive criticism, Motivation and taking initiative, understanding workplace culture, policy and safety, speaking, listening, interacting with coworkers. That's pretty much what was in that article by the end of the um, My background has been developing, um, working with students to develop the skills to be successful in the workplace. Um, yet for students with Learning barriers, reaching these levels can be quite difficult. They, um, they struggle with uh, decision making, planning, scheduling, follow through, relationship building, advocacy, communication, money skills, and managing personal items, just to mention a few of them. These are the types of skills, almost like a subset of vocational, pre-vocational skills that are getting addressed by ICE program. Um, and if these skills are not addressed, 
then the chances of success for these individuals as they transition out of high school is not very good. I mean, if, if you know, if, if you have struggles building relationships or, or with follow through, you're not going to be successful in the workplace. Brian and I are working daily on all of these skills. Um, he, he uses a planner. He makes he's working on making his own decisions. Um, I, I have to say it's, it, it's an honor working with Brian. That um, he, um, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody so attentive in a classroom. He hangs on every word that his professor says. Brian and I are still trying to figure out ways so that he can express what he's working. We're working with a um, with a learning specialist here at UMass. Um, the um, DESE, or the Future Ready Initiative, um, identifies three phases of um, transitional development. Um, awareness, and this relates to both location. Awareness, exploration, and immersion. These things can't happen in the classroom. They need to occur in the community, especially that piece around immersion. That, um, that in my, from my background of um, helping individuals get into the workplace, the learning is not abstract, it's hands-on. The relationships are real. You're not reading out of a book. You're not looking at a picture. You're like, here's your boss. Here's the job. Here's the task. Work together. Um, I am a lifelong advocate of community-based programming. Um, I um, am a proponent of immersion with the right supports. Um, I have, um, through working as an ed coach, I have. Um, witnessed a young man with Down syndrome be the first student to be off script in his acting class. I have seen young people learn to proudly commute to school via public bus and later use that same skill to get to their jobs. Um, I have seen students transfer the skills learned through the ICE program, like the planning, the time management skills, to the workplace. Texting, communication skills that um, I have, um, and I currently have the honor of working with them. Um, you have to say, and DESE is serious about future ready goals. It needs to continue to support this bold experiment, experiment and fund ICE program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? from the task force. Thank you very much. I'm just going to um, say, and you were probably going to do this anyway, but to remind people, and Brian, your testimony was great, and if you could submit it, maybe you want to give the website again. I will. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Great job, Brian. are still reasonably within schedule here. We are wrapping up. That is everybody that we have scheduled to testimony and then in consideration of everybody's time. Um, we're wrapping up. I, this is the last hearing that we're having as a task force. Um, we've had four hearings across the state. They've been phenomenal. We've learned a tremendous amount. Um, we as a task force are now going to go back and begin to assemble a report that will be worked on by all the members. Um, the expectation is there will be a rollout of that report sometimes in the next few months at the State House in Boston. Um, everybody will be continue to be informed through the website. Let me give you the website again to submit testimony, to get information. We will put up the links to Think College and some of the videos. Um, Dr. Malafaria also has a part of the promotion of the State University system and the promotion of Bridgewater State University as a commercial that he just showed me um, that will begin running on our um, Boston networks. I don't know if they're going to be running on the Western networks. Advertising Bridgewater State University that actually um, looks at and uses the ICE model as part of the promotion of Bridgewater State University, which you just showed me. It will be up on the website as well as long as we're not 
breaching any you know, intellectual properties information. So there'll be continue to be lots of information on the website. Um, the website again is tomworksross.com backslash task force, all one word. Um, and I, what we'll do on that too is there'll be a sign up so that you can get emails out of there that will be put on there and I'm telling. So you'll be able to just sign up for future information of when the, the um, uh, rollout will be uh, in Boston. So I want to thank the task force for their tremendous insight and for the work they've done and the work they will continue to do on the task force. And thank all of you for coming here today and particularly um, to thank um, the University of Massachusetts um, and thank you James Staros for being here uh, and for hosting us. Um, it's been a tremendous experience doing this and uh, this is only the beginning of the conversation. So thank you all for your participation.